It's all very embarrassing because I come in at the end as if I have some new and important knowledge that I've picked up on the road and I'm going to give it to you and it's all very <laughs> breathless and exciting and that's not the case. Uh, sorry. Um, I thought I would talk a bit about uh, something that I know you've already talked about this morning, uh, which is the energy uh, scene in Mexico. And then uh, go back to a panel discussion or, or, or have some more uh, conversation with, the, uh, uh, with all of you. Uh, let me say I am, uh, notwithstanding what Charles has said, that you shouldn't believe anything I say. <laughs> and I think that's a good place to begin. Uh, I do think that we are at a very important juncture in Mexican history when it comes to energy. Uh, I do think that the next sexenio will see some potentially profound changes in the question relating to private investment in the energy field. Now, I say potentially because I think there are a lot of things that could happen that might make this change less um, important than it should be. Let me, let me just give you a little of my personal background uh, to tell you why I'm optimistic and why I'm cautious. Uh, I had, uh, on a personal level, I had served in Venezuela as the number two in the embassy from 1986 to 1988, okay? At that time, well, you will recall that Venezuela followed Mexico's uh, pattern of nationalizing the oil industry. It did it almost 30 years later in 1968. And it was still very fresh in the minds of, of Venezuelans when I was there 20 years later. And it was actually taboo. It was not a topic that one could discuss in polite company. <laughs> the idea that somehow there would be new opportunities for the private sector. Um, I don't like to use the term privatization either in Venezuela or in Mexico because we're not talking about privatization. We're talking about new opportunities. Um, I went away in 1988. I came back uh, five or six years later and everybody was talking about the new model for Venezuela. And in a very short period of time, that which had been taboo became common conversation. Now, I think that's what we're seeing in Mexico now. After years and years in which uh, politicians and opinion leaders have been unwilling to talk openly, for the most part, about a new structure for the petroleum industry, now it is accepted, it's talked about, uh, uh, you can mention it in polite company. I'll give you an anecdote. We had here, Jeremy Martin was here, and, and some others, uh, 10 years ago, when Felipe Calderon, we met, Felipe Calderon was at that point Minister of Energy. Uh, and we met with him in Mexico, we met with him up here, and in private conversation, he was quite open that what he wanted to do for the Fox administration was an opening of the petroleum sector. And he had a fairly well elaborated plan. This is what he was going to do as Minister of Energy. Well, he got nothing done. Then we saw him again when he was running as a candidate for president. And he repeated this again, privately, that given all the problems within the Mexican petroleum sector, way, a way had to be found to get new investment so that uh, uh, output could be increased. Well, he talked about it quietly, 
tried to do a few things, and here we are at the end of Calderon's uh, six-year term, and really not much has been done. Now, the difference now is that politicians are being very open and talking about the need for privatization. And once again, nobody is talking about total privatization, but ways of attracting uh, private investment. Uh, certainly, Peña Nieto has made this an important part of his campaign. Josefina Vasquez has also talked about it. I don't think uh, Lopez Obrador uh, uh, has talked about it or is, uh, certainly is not in favor of, it, uh, favor of it. If we assume that Peña Nieto is going to win, and I, uh, I don't know that's the case right now, it looks like it's the case, then this will be a very important issue very early in his administration. And the point about talking about Venezuela is uh, it's just very interesting to watch how societies, democratic societies, uh, change their thinking. And there are probably topics right now in the United States that uh, uh, politicians don't really want to talk about come back five years from now and maybe they'll all be talking about it. I happen to think, uh, this is irrelevant to this conversation, I happen to think that the legalization of marijuana is one of those things that it's going to be no, 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 and then all of a sudden, yes. But... Well, the governor of New York is talking about it now. Yeah, and it's, it's already begun. But... What accounts for that change? How does, how does the, the intellectual or cultural uh, environment uh, uh, change? And it's, it's certainly something for, for all of us to study. Now, let us say that Peña Nieto wins. Uh, let us further say that uh, he has a lot of strength in Congress. I don't know whether it would be a majority. Let us further say that the PAN, if it's serious, would probably go along with uh, uh, Peña Nieto. And there would be a, cons uh, a sufficient body of political weight in the country to bring about change. Now, there are several issues that have to be looked at. One is, what will be the response of the left? I think a lot may depend on how the election turns out in terms not of who wins, who loses, but should Lopez Obrador lose, and it does appear that that's going to be the case, but we don't know, how is he going to respond? And are we going to have to go through a period of street demonstrations uh, and uh, public uh, contention and maybe violence for a period of months as we did six years ago. If that is the case, that certainly would make it much more difficult for a new Peña Neto government to move rapidly on on uh, opening the oil sector. Secondly, in terms of public opposition, I think one of the things that is interesting me most about this current campaign is, let's call it the student movement. Uh, soy 132. And here you have large numbers of people, mostly students, not all, uh, from uh, all sectors of society who are demonstrating what they feel to be great mistrust for the entire political class. Okay? Now, here's where I see this as potentially quite interesting because many of these, let's call them students, are, let's say, modern in their thinking. You know, 
generally willing to accept the idea that there should be a change in the petroleum sector and hydrocarbons. But their suspicion of the government and of the political elites is so great that this may lead them to make a common cause with people further to the left joined in their anger against those who want who uh, in the new government, even though the people in the new government may be arguing for change. I think the political climate in Mexico that comes out of the election may be one which is in some ways toxic and would make change difficult. <coughs> that's, that's the first point. Um, another major issue is that although we know the PRI has won many elections uh, uh, over the, the, the past uh, years, will probably win many more governorships uh, in July, uh, this is not the same PRI that existed a dozen or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. The ability of, the, of Los Pinos or the pre-president, again, assuming that it is a pre-president, and maybe it is not, but let's assume that, to impose his will on the state governors and on maybe members of the legislature, on others, as could have been the case and was often the case in generations past, that no longer exists. The pre that will run the country is not the pre that ran the country. It's not your father's pre. <laughs> yeah? So a lot of, of these issues uh, bring about what, uh, there's a great phrase in, in uh, India, when the Indians uh, talk about uh, politics, they, I've never heard it anywhere else called, Fissiparous tendencies, or fissiparous tendencies. You can look it up. <laughs> F-I- How do you spell it? <laughs> F-I-S-S-A-P-A-R-O-U-S, I think. But I'm making that up. Uh, which means things tend to fall apart. The tendency to pull things apart uh, is 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 stronger than the tendency to pull things together, but okay, let's fractile. Th pardon? Fractile. Yeah, it's the difference between centrip centripetal and centrifugal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, would you like to talk about physics? I would. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, here is my. Uh, uh, frankly, my biggest concern, and we've seen this over the last <laughs> six years. When one talks to Pemex, when one talks to the uh, Ministry of Energy or the government of Mexico, they will tell you with varying degrees of honesty and commitment that there has been a reform in the petroleum sector during these past six years. Now, Jeremy has studied this very closely, and he can tell you exactly what has changed. Uh, uh, and some of these, on paper at least, look significant. But I think most people who are involved in hydrocarbons in Mexico would say that for all of the changes that Pemex talks about, uh, in point of fact, the net effect, the results, have been minimal. If somebody feels differently, let me know. But most everybody believes that for all of the talking and all of the pushing and shoving, nothing has really changed. Now, my principal concern is this. New government will come in. Let's again say Peña Nieto. will move fairly quickly to bring about 
change, which will probably will have to be constitutional change. This will be fought out at so many different layers of government, federal, state, undoubtedly will wind up in the Supreme Court. I, I don't see how it can not. That it will take a, there will be a couple of impacts. One, it will take a long time. We're talking about significant change that may take the whole next sexenio before it's ready to go, before new money comes in, so to speak. And secondly, given the nature of Mexican politics, which has many negative aspects, but many positive aspects as well, it tends towards consensus. Mexican politics does. And we may see a great battle being fought in the national parliament, state parliament, Supreme Court, uh, in the press, among politicians, as a topic, keep in mind, if this isn't going to be done now, and I don't think it can be done now, then it's a principal topic for the elections in three years. So we may see, como se dice? Mucho ruido y muy pocos nueces. A, fury. <laughs> a lot of sound and fury to produce not very much. Now, is there a way around that? Yes, there is. The way around that is that the new government comes in with a very dynamic, aggressive, uh, well thought out plan and fights like hell at all levels to keep it and to push it. Now, as I've said, there is a tendency in Mexican politics to round off the sharp edges, to look for compromise, to avoid contention and seek consensus. And I think if we meet here again in six years and we're having the same damn conversation, I think it will be very sad, but it could be very possible. Sure. All right? Now, what makes this all, and this will be the last thing I say, um, what makes this all even more interesting, and I'm sure you've talked about this, is that we may be living through a major energy revolution in the world, and in particular in North America. We are seeing major new developments, particularly in terms of uh, shale oil and shale gas. We are looking at the possibility that the, the dependency of the United States and Canada and maybe Mexico on the rest of the world for petroleum and gas will go down and could go down very, very dramatically in the next few years. Yes. It is not a surprise, and I think I'm right on this, that Exxon, who tends to be a lot smarter about these things than I am, and a lot more successful, is investing much more money in the production of natural gas these days than in the production of oil. And other companies are following suit. So we have a situation where the template that has marked or governed the energy scene in this part of the world, and indeed throughout the world, is changing very dramatically. And what happens in Mexico should be part of that change, allowing Mexico to take advantage of what will be a growing emphasis on North America 
as one of the great scenes of energy production. I think after the, our election, we will see the approval of the Keystone Pipeline. That's a little difficult to approve before the election, but it's not going to take too much time after the election. The Canadian tar sands, hydraulic fracking in, in Canada, everything that's happening here in both oil and in uh, natural gas. The fact that the United States itself may become a very major exporter of energy, particularly uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, means that the world that we live in in North America is changing dramatically and that Mexico has an opportunity, if, it's, if, it, could, if it can work out these difficulties, of really taking advantage of that. On liquefied natural gas, of course, you know, because just in ja gas generally, because we're producing so much gas, I'm not talking about gasoline, I'm talking about natural gas, the price keeps going down. Now, the oil companies are desperately, the gas companies, are desperately looking for a way to raise the price. The way they raise the price is by internationalizing the sale of this gas. There has never been an international gas market. The price of, you know, we all know, the price of oil in Europe is pretty much the price of oil in the United States, is pretty much the price of oil in Asia. I'm not talking about at the gas station, I'm talking about uh, what it costs per barrel. For gas, there's a much different price here than in Asia, than in Europe, than in other places, and it's very cheap here. So if I ran a big gas company, I would try to turn this into something that I could export and get a European or an Asian price for it rather than an American price. So I think we're going to see the internationalization of the gas, natural gas industry. All right, let me finish here and just r recap. Uh, we live in very exciting times. Uh, we're going through an energy revolution. North America is the center of this revolution. Mexico has an opportunity to take advantage of this in many different ways. It is exciting in Mexico because for the first time you have a sufficient number of politicians and opinion leaders who have gone beyond the taboo and are talking about a real change in that country. My concerns are, are that the opposition that could come from the streets, from the political left, from the new student movements, from a pre that is divided with thousands of vested interests, could keep Mexico from doing what most people, most serious people now believe has to be done as a way of attracting uh, private investment. Mexico will not only uh, see its current situation diminish, but will lose the opportunity to take part in what is this revolution, this exciting revolution that I've talked about. So we'll see what happens.